Thank you everyone for coming. My name is Jeff Morgan. Um, I'm with Grimshaw Architects, but also a member of the uh, Council for Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat here in Sydney and as part of the New South Wales chapter. Um, We'd like to really welcome you all to this event tonight. It's the, the relaunch of our Design Excellence series, which some of you may know was a, a, a quite successful series that we held in years past, but due to the um, international conference coming uh, to Sydney last year, our, our committee was fully committed to delivering uh, that conference. So we're really happy to, to have the opportunity to relaunch this series of events. Hopefully this is uh, the first of uh, three more to follow later this year. So tonight's event is really all about celebrating, exposing, and inquiring around all of the competition entries for One Sydney Park. It's a unique series of events that we feel offers great opportunity for all that are involved as we share the different thinking and approaches of the, of the various teams. Bit of a blurb on the on CTBUH. Um, the Council for Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat is one of the world's leading resources for professionals focused on the inception, design, construction, and operation of tall buildings and their urban habitat. We're a non-for-profit organization founded in 1969 based out of Chicago's Illinois Institute of Technology. The CTBUH facilitates the exchange of the latest knowledge available on tall buildings around the world through publications, research, events, uh, working groups, web resources, and its extensive network of international representatives. Um, at this time, would you please welcome Emmanuel Oros of Spark Helmore, our host for this evening, to say a few wel welcoming words. Emmanuel? Uh, thank you, Jeff. So, good evening all. I promised Jeff I wouldn't take more than maybe a couple of minutes at most. Um, as Jeff said, my name's Emmanuel Oris. I'm one of the lead people that manage the property and development team amongst with my, uh, my partners that are here tonight to chat to you all. Um, on behalf of all the partners here at Sparks, we'd like to welcome you along and thank you very much for joining us for tonight's festivities. Uh, it's a real privilege to be able to support the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat and I'm very glad to see a lot of friendly faces that I do recognise uh, and we've had the pleasure of do working with over the years um, over a number of projects, including some guys from Bait Smart who actually helped with the fit out at these offices, which we moved into only a couple of years ago. Um, as everyone's aware, the whole development world has been going through a bit of a, a transformation phase over the years. Uh, there's been a real push for better design eco-friendliness, infrastructure, livability, and not to mention, of course, the push for higher density and all the difficulties that comes with it. So being on the front of a range of developments, us lawyers get to not only engage with a range of different disciplines, but we also see the practicalities of this transformation as it's been coming along over the years. Uh, one of the key points of practice here at the firm that we have front and centre is consultation. That doesn't just mean consultation with clients and their consultants, architects and designers and the like. It also means consultation with other peers, with other law firms, um, cross consultation amongst us all to share ideas and to make sure we get a better outcome for the clients. Not everyone's eager to do this at sometimes. Indeed, some flat out refuse because of some perception that it's gonna negatively impact them in some way, shape or form. My experience has been quite the opposite. I spend quite a lot of time in consult consulting with other law firms and other lawyers and cross-discipline. Um, and it's been a great benefit to, to me, my practice, and to our firm in general. And it's something that we take uh, front and centre. That's one of the reasons why we were very eager from the outset to host tonight's event um, and put our support behind it because of that idea of supporting openness and consultation and this sharing of ideas so that everyone benefits collectively. Um, and what a great project to, to talk about tonight, the One Sydney Park at Alexandria. We've had the privilege of being able to deal closely with HPG um, and on the project throughout. So we amongst the rest of you tonight uh, are just as eager to see some of the other projects that are out there, some of the other ideas and presentations so that we can get a bit of a feel of um, you know, some of the other ideas that were out there at the time um, and we're very eager to chat amongst you all at the end of tonight to, um, to see and share your thoughts and ideas, not only the existing project but some of the ideas that we're going to talk about tonight. So with that, just again, thank you, welcome and please enjoy yourself this evening.
Thank you, Emmanuel. Um, just before we get to the presentations, uh, I'd also like to welcome Barnaby Oros from HPG Australia, the developers of One Sydney Park, who are also uh, with us here this evening just to say a few words. Barnaby? Uh, thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming along. Um, look, I'll be very brief. Um, I guess I get to set the scene a little bit for the competition, which is really um, pretty much what we did in the competition. Uh, we set the, the, the groundwork up and um, sat back and just let the creatives step in and take us through the pro It was pretty amazing, actually, and I'm, I'm sure you'll be um, taken aback with what they did. The amount of work that these guys did within the four weeks, five weeks, four weeks, four, sorry. <laughs> I thought it was five, yeah, four weeks. Um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was amazing. So it's only fair, actually, I remember seeing the, the um, uh, all the all the entries and thinking, isn't it a shame that no one gets to see these? Um, our underlying principles w was that we would be happy to work with any one of the four architectural firms that you'll see. Um, they all combined with landscape uh, firms, uh, Architectus with Turf, Woods Bagot with Coxall, McGregor, McGregor, Coxall, um, Make London with Aspect, <coughs> and uh, Sylvester Fuller, MHNDU, with uh, Sue Barnsley. So, you know, just even just the landscape, uh, the amount of work that went into the landscape, it is front and centre of very much a landscape project as much as anything else. Um, I'm sure you'll enjoy looking at the entries. Um, just quickly to set the scene, basically our vision, <coughs> HPG's vision, was that it was a landmark project for us. So it wasn't just another block of flats somewhere. It's a landmark project. It had to be better than what people might ordinarily expect to go in this place. Um, we were very much focused on transformation because it told a bigger story than just transformation of this particular site, but about ourselves as well and the inner west, inner east, the location itself. Um, Council also had a very strong vision. Graham had a very strong vision as to what was going to go there. I'm sure you all know. Um, complexities really kicked in. So the connection to Sydney Park, whilst you look at it and think, wow, we're, we are in a park, and I think that's pretty unique. There's not many other places where you're actually set within a park. Um, it also introduces a lot of complexities um, that these guys had to grapple with. So the connection to the park and the sensitivity of that, the visual connection, so the, the, the um, visual impact from the park and to the park. Uh, and uh, thirdly, I mean, we've got some of the constraints such as the emerging West Connects and, and um, uh, changing nature of Euston Road. Um, you know, impacting upon the project that we couldn't just shy away from and pretend it wasn't there. We had to deal with it, and we have. Um, uh, in the end, though, I've got to say that um, we've, we've been very pleased with not just the architects that were selected, but with the process itself, to, to give credit to Sydney City Council. Someone asked me outside, um, you know, do you think you would have gotten this result without the competition? It was a really good question, actually. I think, I don't know that we would have. I, I really, I saw the blood, sweat and tears that these guys put into it, and I don't know, I think that's what the competition does. It just drives that creativity to go that extra mile. So, without holding you up, let's look at the entries. So the first of this evening is the presentation uh, by Neil Hill of Woods Bagot, representing their collaboration with McGregor Coxall. Neil joined Woods Bagot as a design director in March 2016 to contribute to strengthen design capability locally and internationally. As part of the design leadership team, Neil brings a strong design reputation in large complex projects in urban public transport, urban design, education and residential. Previously, Neil was part of the PTW team in Sydney, leading the design of the Calix, Royal Botanic Gardens, 221 Miller Street, North Sydney, and other large-scale projects. Neil was also the joint discipline leader in Hassel's Brisbane studio, where he was the architectural lead for several infrastructure and education projects, and more recently in their Sydney studio, working on the Northwest Rail and the Tibby Cotter Walkway. Would you please welcome Neil Hill.
Well, good evening everyone. Thank you for uh, turning up. Um, I will do this in 10 minutes, so I've got 10 seconds per slide. Um, working with McGregor Coxall has been an absolute joy in this project and um, yes, it's four weeks of intense activity, but I must say it's been a really enjoyable process with uh, working with um, HPG and Barney. Um, my history on the project is a bit unusual. I was at PTW uh, where we kind of had to break the shackles of the project. Uh, City of Sydney were very resistant to development on the site per se, B4 mixed use, and the initial comments were, we're not going to allow it. Um, so effectively we had to work with Graham and his team to break something open and work with them. So the initial idea of bringing the fingers in and, and sort of splaying them down and reducing the visual amenity or I visual impact on the park was kind of the moment that unlocked the key. I think you, you would agree. And then Dario, colleague at um, uh, Architectus, then took it forward into a stage one DA. The relationship with McGregor Coxall was, for me personally, was on the Calix project. Um, I have a great respect for this team. They're very creative. And we felt that Sydney Park needed that creativity and almost, to, you know, really to be a 50-50 led process. So we're very sort of given over to this. And then with Woods Bag at Short Lane is one of the residential projects you'll probably see this year, um, is another very interesting small scale integrated project with, uh, with landscape. I won't go into the site um, location too much, but it's a very unusual location. It's rich in all kinds of ways. It has great history. It's also very, uh, shall we say, it's Sydney, City of Sydney's largest public park, and that's really interesting, including the parts that they own of Centennial. And in, in, in that regard, there was a great responsibility in terms of what we do with the development. The site itself is unusual. It's sitting out there. It, it's kind of a legacy site. To the, uh, to the east of it is the Alexandria. It's still employment land, it's light industrial, and it will remain so for some time. So it's at the um, sort of confluence of a whole range of um, city forces at play. With the uh, industrial buildings just behind Euston Road on the eastern side, it's very low scale sort of tin shed territory, and I understand it's, it's going to change, but it's not going to change a lot. So we're in with sort of two very distinct worlds. Uh, the interchange at St Peter's, kind of Armageddon if you're sort of a, you know, a, a, a sort of a, someone who wants solace in the, in the landscape, um, but a traffic engineer's joy. Um, but that's effectively how the road will find its way to the various destinations. That tells us Houston Road itself is going to be very busy. And the park itself, incredible work done by the landscape team through here, water sensitive urban design, probably one of the benchmarks in Sydney, and this will sort of drive some of our thinking. Now the brickworks itself, um, it was hard not to get yeah, sort of so inspired by brickwork, the brick, the art of making, the sort of sensitivity around materiality and the human scale that that brings with it. So the artisan's approach. So we thought, can we stream this into the project a little bit? And so the ubiquitous architect sketches, which mean sort of very little to most people, but effectively the brick stacks, the way that they're held together by the steel straps, you know, sort of the engineering around that, um, the way that the clay was used in that time, the industrial uh, typologies, and effectively what we're now seeing is a met metamorphosis around uh, Newtown, St Peter's and around these areas in terms of the sociological changes. And I'm sure that the uh, marketing effort that's going on with this project and the sorts of people and what they want, particularly around the arts community, um, is going to find its feet in due course. Very briefly, the, the, the diagram was pretty clear in the Stage 1 DA. Um, we felt that it did have further room for improvement, so breaking the scale of these finger buildings and breaking them into smaller social areas was part of our thinking. Um, and then clearly with, from, a, from a, uh, I suppose an occupant's point of view, the views out, they lend themselves to that. It was trying to get a sense of place within quite a large development and in terms of the scale of Sydney Park, it was actually the local scale that we felt needed some attention. So the water, water um, sensitive urban design attributes, the way the ponds, which is a part of a creek system back to the Cooks River, that sort of inspired particularly um, our landscape collaborators, McGregor Coxon, in terms of how that water can be brought into the site. And there they are from a sort of one of the, uh, you know, aerial views. Now, from a materialistic point of view, we felt that the building had some opportunity for sedimentary. So the idea of alluvial clays and what's happening in this very high water table around the um, Botany Bay and bringing clay into the, into the built form. But 
not necessarily an overly dominant form, it was essentially the base of the building structure and then the modulation of it because because of the economy of, shall we say, constructability and trying to get a sense of um, how this project, which is quite significant in scale, could break down into its elements was important to us. But as we know with the technologies around and the modularity of brickwork and even you know, the computerisation of brick lane could actually lead to some really interesting um, textual opportunities on the site. So we chose at the onset not to really challenge the um, the uh, the project because it would have been a bit of about face had been behind the sort of initial shape. But so essentially, what could we do to make it better was the was the question that we posed. So we worked with the scheme. Effectively, the diagram here shows the water as it was coming through as a sort of an urban wetlands idea, which came in rough, roughly 50% of the site, and then splicing the buildings with lobbies halfway through it and then making those the place settings that then uh, descend into the um, basement construction. The buildings on Euston Road were a very different ensemble. The breakdown at the top of the building, particularly when you're at the highest point in the park looking toward Mascot is important, so that the breakdown of the scale as it steps toward the western edge of the, of the development. We took an approach here on the Euston Road elevation of kind of almost a, a very rigorous modularity. So a screening system, acoustically very challenging, high traffic volumes, I forgot the figure, 11,000 cars or something per, per hour or per day, something like that. Yeah, so it effectively we took an idea of a layered approach where you could um, create a circulation system from the other side and then create urban gardens to the residents that were going to occupy these buildings. Uh, at the higher levels and these were sort of early thoughts around how we could modulise it and break it into a sort of rhythm. We thought the idea of movement on Euston Road should be accounted for so effectively what you won't see, you will only see this at a glance where most of the dwell time would be on the opposite side of the development. Um, but conversely on the opposite side the tranquility that this park offers the idea of the urban wetlands coming in and then descending through the scales of the development so this uh, in the light blue you might just see we've got this kind of a mushroom shaped object which is a big spiral stair that descends into the basement we wanted the address to work at both levels from both surface and also below and then the idea of this wetlands coming through and so effectively it's we're not proposing necessarily a waterfront development that Sydney side is known love it's actually the tranquility of the park and the wetlands just on the other side of the berm we wanted to bring that experience into the re for the residents uh, into the park and then as that sort of leaves out and then as we raise up. So we didn't, it might sound a bit silly, but we didn't want to really do too much with the architecture. We felt that the landscape was so powerful and the landscape ideas were so powerful that the architecture could kind of sort of play second tier to it. Importantly though, the, the privacy between residents was all accounted for as you'd expect. So with the basement, not that I want to go on about the basement here, but those yellow circles effectively the addresses, the pools of light that come down and these are the points at which you experience your journey because some people be, will use their cars quite often in this location and the journey through um, uh, into the apartment was no less important. And you know how the apartments sort of work on their boardwalk so we had the idea of timber boardwalks and sort of you know terraced housing and the typology of the terraced housing as it comes down we like the idea of a hybrid there is this idea that needs to be um, challenged in Sydney where you move to an apartment and then you leave the apartment when you've got a family and you have to pay the government a shitload of money to do that. So we thought, are there typologies where you can actually allow people to grow into certain typologies in the development and does that work from a marketing perspective? In this case, it's a two-house, two-level townhouse. You could, if you will, have a, have a dedicated car parking arrangement, garaging, which is more sort of, you know, um, terrace in Paddington and places like that or or not and I don't know how this is folding out in terms of the marketability of the apartments but the other at the other spe level of the spectrum we've got the uh, sort of high level apartments at the terrace in stepping down and that presents a really beautiful sort of idea of panoramic views and so forth which is the unique char characteristic of Sydney Park so getting that sort of you know Sydney Park view into these sort of uh, terraced apartments was another part of the design study Modularity where, you know, the um, value for money proposition, because we're competing here in a very tight market in Sydney, so what can we do construction-wise to get some really good modularity into the project, but don't make it less rich in terms of what you do in different buildings and different parts. Materialistically, um, as I was mentioning, the, the sort of the idea of um, bringing the earth up and allowing the sort of the landscape to fold through and then terracing through is important. And the little sort of um, vignettes down the bottom, we're trying to get a bit of an understanding of what sort of people would occupy this place, perhaps stereotypically in these sketches, but I'm sure there's a whole range of more demographic 
um, you know, experiences that will, be, will occur in Sydney Park. Now I'm going to attempt to present some of the work, I'll race through these diagrams of McGregor Coxall noting the time, but effectively this team just absolutely amazed us. They got into this in a big way and they looked at the wetlands, they started the... Um, Sorry, I I've got 10 minutes now, so that's yeah, yeah. great. Um, <laughs> so if effectively the idea in the diagram on the left was to fold the landscape through and create unique experiences into each finger, if that makes sense. So each one was different and it provided buyers of this apartment, you know, the choice of what sort of environment, habitat they would want to uh, occupy. Um, the team uh, led by Phil um, Coxell we effectively looked at how the um, landscape could actually work in this environment. Look, we have to put our hand on the heart and say we were challenging the commercialities of the project in terms of wetland setting because it is, from a, you know, shall we say, a strata management cost point of view, quite a challenging environment to do. So we had some questions in terms of the jury presentation on this. Um, I won't go into the detail of the plants because I'd just make a mockery of myself. I really don't know. But effectively the layering and the indigenous landscape that was um, very much part of Sydney Park today could fold into the development into the future. And then getting the experience of this space, the tranquility in the pockets that landscape can offer you. You don't need a lot of dimension to create a wonderful outdoor environment and feel like you're in your own environment even though you're actually in a very fairly, a fairly high density development. And so the, the wetlands were in the western side of the park and they <laughs> folded in to create um, a different environments. The, the roof landscape was no less important and we wanted really to work with what City of Sydney had said and challenged I guess the developers and the architects on the team to get really occupiable deep soil planting on the on the top. Economically that's difficult to achieve but we feel with, with some of the more recent developments in Sydney this is actually incumbent not just for the development itself but also the uh, sort of the heat island effect that you're seeing across the city. So the zones that were created, the tranquility of the berm itself, we felt was an opportunity. So as you move, transition from the park to the development, and that kind of serpentine idea of moving through was great. And then, you know, pockets that were more water-based and the sort of the landscapes that you could achieve in this environment. And then as you move deeper into the development, we like the idea of the lobbies that were created halfway through those fingers also enjoying sort of unique parts of the landscape setting. And then as we move deeper into the park, we wanted the idea of the landscape to buffer and create, so we say, um, micro experiences and, um, and so forth. And then here was the idea of the art spine, where the spiral staircase descending into the basement area using raw materials and the landscape folding <coughs> through was another layered setting. So it's a setting of layers and using landscape to kind of set the narrative for the project, not the architecture, which sounds a bit odd as an architect speaking. Um, and so on. So as we move through the project, I won't bore you to tears with apartment plans, I'm sure, sure you know all the issues with SEP 65 and so on, but effectively we didn't go, we didn't push the button for high, highest yield, we went for a sort of a more temperate version of larger scale departments, um, and each one getting the, uh, sort of, but you know, having said that, the modularity, all of the, the rules that we follow in the project, and some of the plans, I thought I'd just pop them up to show you sort of the level that I guess all of the competitors in this project had to get to to satisfy the, the project, and that's me and McGregor Coxall. Thank you. I now like to welcome Penny Fuller, founding partner of Sylvester Fuller. Their entry was a, in collaboration with M MHNDU Union and Sue Barnsley Design. Oh, this is the bit that I'm dreading. I'm going to um, make a mockery of my uh, French pronunciation. Penny studied architecture at the University of Canberra with a stint in Paris at the École d'Architecture de Paris Valdemont. Whew. Um, upon graduation, Penny worked uh, on Renzo Piano's Aurora Place with partner architect group GSA. In 2002, Penny joined Inga Lamour and during her three years with the practice, she worked on and led a number of projects in Australia, ranging from single residential up to 40-story multi-residential multi towers. In, two in 2005, Penny joined Foster & Partners in London, and during this time, she worked as an associate leading design teams on the development of large-scale projects with budgets up to 450 million. In recognition of uh, Sylvester Fuller's first built projects, Penny was the recipient of the Institute of Architects Emerging Architects Prize. Would everyone please welcome Penny Fuller. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, 
I'll try and stick to the 10 minutes. Um, our, our team was a little different. We have a, a um, equal split architecture, Sylvester Fuller MHN DU, and it was um, it is a, a very equal shared design relationship, um, and it's working really well. Uh, we love working with them very much, and of course, teamed with Sue Barnsley for the landscape. Liam's here tonight from MHN, and he has to answer all the questions. <laughs> We'll talk very briefly through some of the, the key um, competition themes that we presented. We'll start with the project vision and we'll finish with a little more detail on the architecture. But the vision really is a summary of all of the, the key opportunities that we felt were inherent within our concept. And they are the opportunity to invite the, the park onto the site as a folded, layered and very diverse landscape. A recognition of the context that surrounds the site, from the solidity of the, the brickwork to the feathered nature of the tree canopies that surround the site. A rare opportunity to rethink subterranean spaces an arrival level that's filled with natural light and ventilation, a rich materiality, and of a volume that could allow a diverse range of uses and a future flexibility. A new public plaza that's connected to the park, but very complementary in its amenity. And then lastly, a multi-layered veil, which buffers the homes and the public plaza beyond from the differing context of Euston Road. So we, we looked at a, a lot of different massing options for the site, but we came back actually to the stage one DA um, there was a lot of sense in that and, and while we tested it as much as we could, we, we, did, we did come back to this. And we really went through a series of optimizations um, rather than a complete change in the end. And so optimizing the dimensions of the, the fingers for the planning, <coughs> consolidating some of the mass to connect better to the park and to allow a, a, a car park entry ramp to be housed beneath the buildings. To push some of the mass away from the public plaza to allow a greater amount of sunlight down into this new public plaza space and to the Euston Road homes opposite. And you can see here the overlay of the Stage 1 DA and our new envelope and they're very similar, some very small differences. And then there is a cutting into the, the landscape to create the new arrival level and to really create this dual dual ground level in a way. And you can see the landscape between the, each of the fingers really folds down to this subterranean space. So the arrival level, as you know, there's, there's not the possibility to park up on the street at all, so we brought the street down to the arrival level. And it's marked by the paving, the furniture, the, the types of things that you might see on a village street, and these retail spaces which extend from the, the, the ground level plaza above right down into the basement below. And these very strong connections to the garden where you can see sky, importantly. We, we nicknamed it Sydney, Sydney Park Avenue and the, the volume is, is contained over this street here. There's a drop-off zone and entry into the apartments that occurs from this. In fact, everyone who visits the site via a car or is, it takes an Uber or a taxi has to arrive on this level. So it's a very important space. The materiality is of a village street. The paving of the plaza above is brought down to the, the car park below, to the arrival level, and the green very much merges between the upper and lower spaces. 
And the plaza sits above this and connects through these land landscape spaces and you can see the dual retail levels which extend all the way down and give you a very physical and visual connection to the arrival level below. And glimpses always between each of the fingers to the park beyond. Water is a, a very key element as, as identified, uh, as you identified uh, very clearly, of one Sydney Park. And so that is brought into, into the, the new plaza space. The other thing that's very interesting um, and different about Sydney Park we found is the topography. And so that element is also brought into the, the parks between each of the fingers. point the right way and then the the rooftops um, are they've developed into a more a passive um, more passive environment but they're complementary to the uses below and there's there's food grown and they're, they're a place for the the residents to to escape The restaurants below can use the, the food that's grown there and of course many activities can be um, housed. So we'll talk very briefly through, through the homes, we won't show you all of them, but the, the buildings are, are layered into three for the parkside buildings, the garden terraces, the nest level and the tree houses and Euston Road is nicknamed the east side. So we'll just show you this evening the, the garden terraces. We always think very carefully about the, the types of people, some, some of them are humorous, but we really think about the types of people who might live there and create brief, a brief for ourselves to develop homes for people. Two storey garden terraces on the lower level. I should point out that the interiors are by make architecture. So, make architects sorry Simon <laughs> thank you for the correction and um, they're, they're, they're really beautiful <laughs> um, avoid spaces and a, and a real connection to the exterior and the architecture um, that surrounds these are the the end apartments and then we'll finish briefly on the the skin of the buildings so Euston Road um, is a, a tough context in many ways and the, the screening needs to, needs to do a lot of work to really make it a very um, pleasant space for people to inhabit beyond. So the screen is a, a layered veil it, and it protects um, visually and physically from the, the busyness of Euston Road. Ventilation uh, occurs drink, bringing all of the air from the plaza side through the apartments and, and up ventilation chimneys so there's no um, pollution or noise pollution within the apartments. And then the atrium really provides a, a buffer and a garden outlook for, for the residents. And then the parkside buildings as they ro rotate around have a differing, differing orientation to capture the sun the best way possible. And so while the buildings um, are really uh, a family and of the same architectural language, each has to adjust in a unique way to, to benefit from the solar access. So we move from an orthogonal facade to an angled facade and the angle becomes more acute as the building orientation adjusts. The bedrooms are housed on the southern sides of the, the fingers and the living rooms predominantly on the northern side. And the bedrooms are orientated toward the view of the park and provide a very protected outlook for the living spaces which are opposing. The materiality also responds very much to this layering of, of the building from the solidity of the brickwork to the feathered nature of the, 
the, the tree canopy that surrounds the building, surrounds the site. And the idea that we developed was really um, not, to, not to disguise the, the architecture with planting, but really to dissolve the architecture. So much <coughs> the same way that you see in these reference images that there's no defined edge to the building as it moves closer toward the park, <coughs> the building architecture becomes more feathered and imprecise. It's not defined. And so we have a, a, a dual world that happens from the, the very um, defined and solid nature of the, the brick, which is inherent down in the plaza end of the project, to the very feathered and imprecise language of the architecture beyond. Thank you very much. Our next presentation uh, is by Dario Sprola. Did I get that right? Close enough, thank you. Sorry for that. A principal at Architectist. For their competition, competition entry, Architectist partnered with Turf Design. Dario currently leads the Architectist team on Lindley Circular Key Tower and worked closely with Foster and Partners on the competition winning scheme. Among other projects, he is also leading a design study into provision and integration of rail and rail stations into Western Sydney Airport. With over 22 years of experience, he has worked on numerous multi-award winning national and international projects across rail, aviation, commercial, residential, hospitality, education, sports, public, age care, and master planning projects. So very well-rounded, which is great, because sometimes we, we do get pigeonholed. Um, on graduation in 1996, he received the Mitchell, Jurgula, and Thorpe Traveling Scholarship for Design, facilitating six-year relocation to the UK. There he worked on an array of complex, large-scale projects, including significant design role with Richard Rogers' partnership um, on Heathrow Terminal 5. Would you please welcome Dario. Welcome all. Um, first of all, thank you, Barney. Um, it, was a, it was a challenging process getting it to this stage, uh, the stage 1DA um, going through. I worked with Neil, sort of picked up the bat in the afternoon, moved on. <laughs> And uh, my first part in the job was to issue Barney a fee proposal to vary the master plan. And that was, on, uh, that was after sitting in on a meeting with um, Graeme Yarn and hearing Graeme Yarn's position and take on where it was and looking at where it was, and looking at the fee proposal and what money we'd spent and realising there's a whole other process here. Um, so, you know, hats off to Barney, he was very patient and he listened to his designers and I suspect that's very much the same, that current designers are experiencing. So moving on, um, <coughs> I, I moved on and I'm now at Architectus. Um, I, we got involved in this project just before the competition took off. Um, so it's a great opportunity. It was great to get back involved in the project and you know, rekindle relationships. Um, importantly for me, um, having a bit of history with the project, it, it was about stepping back from the project and seeing how my colleagues would necessarily, how they might understand the project and make sense of the opportunity. Um, so one Sydney Park, very special place. Uh, we'll move on, we'll talk about this painting later. Uh, but um, we, we, formed, we brought together a really good team. Turf, I uh, worked with Mike on the Stage 1 DA, uh, reference design for the place. Mike also did some amazing work, which currently you know, is it's in its flesh. He set up the park, rejuvenated the park, so essentially our team knew the park, which, um, which is based, both an advantage and disadvantage, but certainly an advantage. Um, we had some really good people from Arab and, and some really good advice in terms of um, retail planning from Bell, Bellringer, so if you need some retail advice, give them a call. Um, stage 1 DA, right, okay, what was the issue? There was some, lack of, there was some issues like lack of clear hierarchy of spaces, <coughs> um, difficult connections to the park, they were not well defined, um, uh, and the finger buildings were a little long, but they were, they were always a, uh, only ever meant to be envelopes, and, and strictly speaking, I, I think at the time we didn't appreciate that they were going to be hardwired into an envelope, stage 1 DA envelope, that was going to be tightly held by the city, but that says a lot about the planning process and how difficult it is to deal with these very unique sites. Um, so for the client, they've got to take what they get, and hence, you know, they've, they've actually had some good fruit out of this process. Um, so sitting back, talking to my colleagues, we, we tried to open up the 
open up the diagram, see how else it could be done. You know, could it be broken up minute buildings into multiple buildings into long uh, sinuous buildings and the like. Um, after having done all of that, we came back to a version which was not dissimilar to the uh, stage one DA, which is pretty common amongst, uh, I think, three of the scheme, three of the four. Um, the only point of departure is we actually looked at making a, a decent uh, disconnection approximately the middle of the um, long finger buildings. Um, uh, our, our building had three main, um, our pro proposal had three main objectives. One was minimise visual impact on the park, and that was consistent. Next, create a new destination in the park. Um, uh, and third, you know, maximise amenity for the residents in that facility, uh, whilst, not detriment, not, whilst not being detrimental to the broader community in the park. Um, in, in it, these, these are lovely drawings done by um, Turf. Um, they talk about the connection. There's, there's a fantastic network of connections and we were proposing a new connection which, um, which is quite gentle, uh, sort of connected out around the sides, dealt with, dealt with connections that avoided the big hill uh, and were very quiet in the way they sort of connected into the park network. Um, and we also looked at the vegetation and how that might expand into our context in a way, in a way that the vegetation within our context and certainly the buildings was an extension of the park, it, it's certainly in a passive way. Uh, Mike had a very nice, nice description for our buildings that we eventually got to. They were, he called them topographic buildings, i.e. they were buildings of the landscape and they were reminiscent of the, of the of the landforms that you find within the park. So in a way they were quite, they were sort of uh, part of a family sort of looking at the connection and how they may manifest and where it could, where it could occur, we saw the connection could, could occur close to Euston Road in a way where we would respect the existing standard trees. Um, that standard trees also happens where there is quite a fair, fair bit of um, land form um, and level change. Um, we then started looking at the idea of the building that sits along Euston Road as a protective building. Uh, and then, you know, the idea of um, adjacent to the Euston Road building, creating a street and, a, and an active place, a place of activity, a place of gathering, a place of uh, retail commerce. Um, and then essentially the, the residential buildings, which are a combination of, of all these buildings in a way. Um, moving on, then, then we look at integrating the building, bringing the landscape in, um, in addition to that, elements of the water, water, water table. Um, and importantly, we start making distinguish the, the distinctions between um, parts of the site, a sort of hierarchy. We saw the site in two parts, and that was the, the street, street, street precinct adjacent Euston Road. Uh, in addition to that, we actually considered a street within our site, and the idea of a street, you know, a place you can come along and drop off your guests, come and pick up your Uber, and also promenade, you know. You'll, you'll drive along your latest and greatest electric scooter or um, you know, rematch, um, rematch um, you know, fast car. You know, people still like to do that sort of stuff. But also there is the, the garden itself where a lot of the residents will reside. Um, so in essence, conceptually, we had these two parts, the street and the garden. So the street was to be a place that um, res was reminiscent of the brick yards, the industrial context. It was going to be a little bit rough and ready um, versus a garden, which was going to be a calmer space, a place of um, uh, refuge and a place where the local residents could, could you know, live at ease. Um, and I guess that, that you know, beautiful painting by John Singer Sargent sort of captures the, um, the, the, the sort of idea that we were chasing. Here the street. Um The idea of brick, um, which is quite commonly um, commonly seen by others, and the idea of the buildings within the garden, these sort of um, uh, landscape buildings, quite a bit of timber and landscape on the buildings, um, so that they become part of the broader landscape. Moving on, you can see this sketch here it starts exploring how, um, how the hierarchy that's created, how it transitions as you move from Euston Road down to the, land, to the park itself. There's Euston Road, quite busy. We have this protected domain where a lot of the retail happens, where people come and go. Uh, buildings of, uh, along Euston Road are predominantly single-sided. Uh, we have the ventilation stacks bringing air in, which we've seen before, and uh, brought out the top. But then the buildings that uh, move towards the park, there are the buildings that face onto the street, mirror the street. Uh, then the, then the park-like buildings themselves. Um, and this is a view looking from um, the street itself down towards the park, park building precinct. So we move from a brick typology to this landscape building typology. 
Um, standing within the space between the buildings, it's very much um, a very calm space. But importantly, we looked at um, retaining and, and, and sort of reinforcing the distinction and dis well, uh, the separation between this precinct and the park beyond. Uh, and in a sense, being respectful to the fact that the park is, you know, the council's gone to a lot of effort to rejuvenate the park for the greater good. Um, so moving on, um, the active ground plane. Uh, 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 yeah. This is, you know, a ground plane with a, with a real street. The idea of being that you could drive in and you could, you could book ahead on an app, you could pop in, collect your bike, drive out. Um, you, could, you could pop into a 15 minute car park. Uh, pick up some um, um, takeaway. One of the big things that our retail consultant felt was that the community here would be too small to support a viable um, retail precinct. So the idea of allowing people the ability to come in, drop in, collect some goods and like and, and pop out again um, was something we were quite keen on. And also the fact that um, people promenade a lot, um, people like to sit out in the sun and, 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 and the like. Um, there was a series of cafes and like. Um, we also looked at, um, here you can see the architecture and the idea of this sort of being almost like a village, a place that's quite normal, sort of place we travel to when we go to places throughout the world and we sit and we drink coffee and we go, wow, isn't that great? Uh, and you know, these are, these are spaces, they're not, they're not unfamiliar, they're pretty normal. Um, so a lot of what we were proposing was pretty normal in a way. Um, yeah, you can see the sort of spaces that would have been created, the place for uh, market streets down along the spine. And that, that will happen, no doubt. Penny and the team, they will capture all that. And I'm looking forward to seeing it happen. Um, but importantly, we saw the place, you know, place where people can bring their funky little gadgets and ride in and zip out and all that, because um, people do that. Um, but I guess looking at the buildings along Euston Road, um, it was an interesting building. It was both a screen and a filter <coughs> to the precinct. So it had a slightly harder edge. Um, we had this sort of filtered brick um, facade with a series of um, planted um, galleries, uh, lobbies. In addition to that, we proposed this uh, uh, marker, marker building, which would be a building that the client could um, uh, lease out on a yearly basis to artists and residents. And, uh, and in the process, create this sort of a continuation of the art program that um, HPG had initiated with um, Festival of Sydney. So the idea being that a couple of these might be leased out to artists and residents. They would have a gallery, they would set up high, people would come up and view. Uh, and down below, this would be a place where uh, the community could gather, um, so in a very prominent location. And obviously, there are connections and uh, you know associations with the, uh, the chimneys, uh, the Tate Modern, which is a really interesting building in its own right. Uh, for, for those of you who've been up there, it's a fantastic viewing gallery where you can stand and look across to the recently completed Rogers um, uh, Rogers uh, residential buildings and pry into people's private lives. That's all very good. <laughs> Um, so our community building would have had, you know, this lovely folding plane, sports places, places to meet and whatnot. And importantly, this gallery, which would have been um, you know, a series of interesting brickworks. Um, Michael had a lovely idea, and I guess it was a continuation of the water theme and the water rehabilitation um, idea that he, he's, he's been working with in the park for quite a while. And that was the idea of bringing water right down the street, and we've seen that in a few versions. But this idea that the water becomes a play place, you know, it's a splash place. Um, there would be a series of elements cut into that um, water path. So water would be part of the journey and would be celebrated. Um, and I guess um, we start looking at, you know, typical apartments and the, you know, having worked on the um, stage one DA where we had to go into a lot of detail to prove up that the, um, that the apartments actually work and the, and the site could um, fit the yield that was being considered. Um, the, the, the planning actually didn't change too much. You got a series of you know, through apartments, uh, single apartments, essentially two cores either side, and then these are slightly separate buildings. Um, the buildings along Eastern Road are generally singular sided, where the main living spaces face away from the road. So all those considerations that need to be attended to. Uh, and as we move up, move up through the building, we get these incredible opportunities. There's a topographic building sort of cascade back to create these, you know, quite lovely um, living decks. Um, and as we pan away, we start getting a sense of the building, very much something that, you know, has a sense and, and, and an edge that talks to um, its adjacent neighbours across the road. Uh, and then the series, uh, the street is contained by similar buildings. And then there's a transition to this sort of <coughs> landscape building form, um, which in a, in a sense dematerializes back into the park and becomes part of that park from afar. Um, visual impact things, you know, all these things you've got to tick off as you do your competition. Um, yep. 
with trees, without trees. <laughs> you know, hey. But importantly for us, the landscape was, um, we saw it as, a, as an extension of the endemic landscape. So um, uh, high up in the buildings, those are all there by turf, and they, we worked really closely. Mike and, and Scott were fantastic. The idea of the landscape at a different level, different strata, had different characteristics, and the landscape uh, on different faces of the buildings would have their own micro, micro, a micro environment and micro um, responses. But importantly, the landscape up high was, was drier, and as you move down the building, there were opportunities for more, more lush landscape. But in general, landscape for us was a passive thing, something you'd go up and enjoy. But generally, our feeling was that the people that would be buying into this place would be probably stressed out executives in a city, highly paid um, sorts, who want to be in a beautiful place. They want to you know, relax and enjoy. Um, and I, I guess this section is not really that um, out there other than saying the landscape, the way it was proposed was that it, it, it would suggest a continual landscape moving up. Importantly, um, each of these become a, a fire um, separation between the levels so you can afford to have incredibly large pieces of glass. So the landscape did, prove a, did provide a pragmatic outcome as well. Um, so we could have ribbon windows str you know, stretching right around the building. And these lovely drawings done by Scott from Turf. Uh, and I'm sure Mike has had a hand in those as well. Um, and then we come to the end, I guess, um, you know, the, um, the found street becomes the new street, the town street, and John Singer Sargent's drawing becomes our, our garden. Uh, and I guess that's, that's us. Thank you. presentation this evening is from Simon Lincoln of Make. Make collaborated with Aspect Studios for their competition entry. Um, a partner at Make since 2005, Simon relocated to Sydney in 2014 as the lead architect in the development of Winyard Place, subsequently establishing the Make Studio here in Sydney. Simon has worked internationally across the Make Studios in London, the UAE, Hong Kong and Beijing. He has spent two years in Beijing where he completed Make's first built project in China. During the 12 years at Make, Simon has led several high-profile projects across a variety of sectors, including commercial, residential, and urban design. And prior to joining Make, Simon uh, worked at Foster & Partners, as a number of our guests, and myself included, um, on a number of central London projects. Would you please welcome Simon? Good evening. Simon Lincoln from Make Architects, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, that's an in-joke for the architects in the room. So uh, I just wanted to start really by thanking uh, everybody that put today together because you know, for the losers, you, you don't often get to share your, your ideas and you, know, you put your blood, sweat and tears into it and they stay in a drawer somewhere. And anyway, it's, it's, this, is, this is a good thing. It's like therapy, right? <laughs> So uh, check I'm going the right way here. Oh, no, that wasn't us. There we go. So start again. So um, yeah, we joined up with Aspect. Um, it was a great collaboration. Uh, really, the question was, is it a building in the park or is it a park in the building? I think that was sort of something that we were all grappling with. And, and as you've seen by many of the other schemes, uh, it's quite obvious that everybody sort of felt in a similar, similar way. So. We, we took a slightly, slightly different view to the site, um, to, to the other schemes you'll see, or you've seen. Um, obviously, a unique site, unique, unique opportunity, and, and one that you, probably you're never going to get happen again. Um, so, so really, we, we, we thought long and hard about that, as, as I'm, I'm sure everybody else did as well, not to, to take anything away from the other <laughs> people in the room today. Um, but um, so we, we had those conversations with the, with the landscape um, guys, with Sasha, and really, you know, how do, we, how do we consolidate and invite that in? And there were a few, few diagrams that we went through. Uh, so looking at the stage one DA envelope and, and really then how you, can, how you can break that up and as, as everybody's explored, you know, where, where do you come back to? And, and actually we, we, didn't, we didn't come back um, to the stage one DA. <laughs> so we, we, we were here um, with everybody and, and we en actually ended up here. Um, and the reason really for doing that was that we wanted to give everyone a front row seat. So, you know, this is the park, this is the opportunity to, to sort of embrace and, and really how do we maximise views, how do we minimise sort of privacy issues and, and you know, the ADG goes a long way to do that and, 
you know, I think sometimes, um, and, and certainly I guess you could argue, um, we're new in town, so you know, let's rip up the book and, and get on with it. But um, it's probably worth noting that the scheme didn't rip the book up, um, so Barney was still happy with us. But um, you can see it's quite, it's quite different there with, uh, with, our, with our approach. So really opening up to the park, so the Crescent and, and, and really the warehouse building on, on Euston Lane um, was obviously about addressing the, the harsher environment of Euston Road and then that natural uh, curvaceous form that, that we've all been enjoying in the park. Um, and really what that meant was that we could we could open the ends of the scheme up, um, albeit to Graham's sort of... Um, <laughs> it was a slightly contentious. We, we were told not to connect to the park, but to connect to the park, but not to connect to the park. So anyway, we, we felt that we should at least visually and, and allow that opportunity to happen. And so opening the ends up, that curved form really embracing the park, letting the park in, actually consolidating that amount of green space that you get between the buildings otherwise, and, you know, and actually trying to make that um, really meaningful. So. So really then the top, top scheme being the, the DA massing and, the, and ours being the bottom. So just as a comparison, just so that we can talk you through our thinking, was really the, to soften the park boundary. Now some may say, well, you've introduced a, a wall there. Well, actually what it was was a series of buildings held within a, a sort of uh, crescent framework um, and, and not producing a wall and, and having to tear us down to the park. So we, we ended up with that crescent form. We then took the um, consolidation of open space and really distinguished two spaces. There was the backyard and then the laneway, which was the sort of semi-private, sorry, semi-public, and then the, the, the semi-public uh, nature of the backyard. And what that meant was that we could uh, effectively increase the, the views and daylight from those buildings um, rather than the sort of adjacencies that you experience in, in this situation. And then to define the street edge along Euston Road, uh, we felt, as, as others have, that was, that was key to actually protecting, protecting the site. Uh, so as you can see here, just so that you can see I wasn't fibbing, um, that does fit within the, uh, within the parameters that we were working within. And as I say, 100% compliant with the ADG and, and relevant standards. So looking at the backyard, there were really four aspects, the backyard, the crescent, the laneway, and the warehouse and just really talking about the backyard and obviously Sasha's not here tonight he could talk about this a lot better than I can so I'm not going to even attempt it um, other than to say this was really a conversation about um, what's the quintessential Australian back garden you know what can you do in it so we had we had tool sheds that you know community community sharing schemes hens we had veggie patches generally places you could explore and meander and actually connect back to the park uh, places you could sit and have, have picnics and barbecues. So it was really about taking the community space for the people and residents there and, and consolidating that and making that theirs with access to the park. Whereas the, the laneway and the gradation of spaces you see from, from the Crescent um, Community Park down to the private back garden then through to the more public laneway uh, and street that we had at the front, which is more of an urban edge to the landscape. Um, and so a variety of residences. Um, so at the lower level, we had um, terrace garden residences. So they were three or four, uh, two to three to four stories in part, really um, directly onto that that's, uh, communal community space. And then the Crescent building behind, which was effectively a multi-residential, multi-unit um, spread whereby we were containing uh, a large majority of the density on the site, because uh, as you may have gathered, the density is actually it's fairly significant on, on the site, and it's how you, how you break that down and deal with it. Um, so really, how you break that down and deal with it, scale was an issue, um, and, and obviously how you then break those forms down so you can see the breaks within the building but the, the form was holding within the framework that they were inserted within. Uh, obviously push and pull with those so producing terraces, uh, setbacks and natural sort of overshading uh, terraces and, and apartments below. So really looking at the architecture on two faces so on the convex and concaved they were really responding to those environments that they, they were sat within. So heavily greened and um, with, with views unobstructed out. So you can see in this slide, and it's a repeat of the earlier one, whereby we take the shaded blue and, and, and transform it somewhat. So taking the, 
the typical case in the in the in the DA uh, stage one DA, which was 18 metres, which as you all know is is well some of you probably know is that is the minimum, and really making that our our worst case. And beyond that, everything was getting sort of more expansive and and more generous and and opening up to the edges. So the Crescent consisted of townhouses on the lower levels um, and then the mid-levels was really uh, about the, the sort of unit mix of one beds, two beds, three beds and studios. And then the, the treetops, we like to call them, uh, up at the penthouse level, which again, deep planted, uh, deep soil zones. So the laneway, um, from a landscape perspective, was really uh, dealing with the front door and the backyard because there was a combination of the two, but also a, a harder landscape where you could go and you could ride your bike or you could have uh, an impromptu market or set up a marquee and, and have events and actually use that as the public face and invite people into the scheme and through the scheme. So that permeability through the site was actually really important to us. Um, also connecting um, across the site for the residents but also for the public. And what that meant for the architecture on, on the laneway side was really it was a bit harder, uh, slightly less green than the park, but really um, trying to again deal with scale and deal with the terraces at the lower levels and, and really introduce uh, something that was again quite expansive with the, um, with the, the, the nature of the form um, so you didn't feel like you were hemmed in at any time. Um, and then the opposite building at the warehouse was, was doing something similar with, with the language, the slight material change, but a consistent um, approach to the, to the design. And allowing that permeability through the site, through the building. Um, and I'm not going to talk about basements, you'll be pleased to hear. So ours, ours, ours wasn't as beautiful as Penny's. <laughs> Hands up. <laughs> um, so straight onto the warehouse building. Um, we have a different typology here again. This was actually a very challenging building um, in the environment it had to deal with. It looks far more seductive in this render than I'm sure, well, may, maybe, maybe the West Connects will look that nice in a, on a rainy day, but um, we basically took the, um, we took the issue of acoustics um, and, and put in accommodation on that sort of environment and, and, and tried to elevate that and protect it almost by using the community aspect of, of the brief and raising that up and all, uh, it's also a bit of a, um, a billboard for the site whereby you, know, you, you could advertise that with the connections back to the Sydney Biennale. You know, th we provided that, that platform and that was probably the only brick piece we used on the, on the project and that was a brick insert um, really that said this is about the community, this is, this is an art space, this is a dance space, this is somewhere where you can come and inhabit, this is your space. And I think raising that up and, and letting those 11,000 cars, or I don't have the stats, but um, see that every day, we thought that was quite strong. So, and then below that we have the, um, what we like to call the garage, or the garages, whereby every, uh, every startup worth its weight in, in Bitcoin would be uh, pleased to say that they started in their parents' garage. So we wanted to provide that opportunity on site, so you can't, fit, you can't forget those guys. So you can see here the way that um, those two levels work, um, projecting out, pro providing a, an acoustic benefit to the, 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 the apartments on the upper levels. All the living space, obviously, not allowed to be on the, la on the, on the Euston Road, so that was all the duplex apartments were then pushing forward and also getting views of the park. So that was our scheme, um, really, and as I say, thank you very much for letting us talk about it. Um, it's, it's one of those where you either, you either win and you're happy or you either produce something that you're happy with. And I think the important part of the competition is that you develop as a practice and you get ideas out of it and you get to challenge those ideas. Um, you know, and for us, that's as much as a win as, as, I guess, as corny as that sounds. But thank you very much, Barney, for giving us the opportunity and good luck. Thank you. Thank you.